Good morning, everybody. I'm up at Boot Lake Nature Preserve today, and it just still feels like spring is a ways off. <laughs> it's only 30 degrees right now, so it's still a little below freezing. It's supposed to get up to about 41 today, but it's only 30 now. So I'm standing on this hill here, and I'm overlooking Boot Lake. If I step off to the side, if I step off to the side, you can see it a little bit better in the camera. When I'm in front of the camera, the camera focuses on me. So a lot of times it'll look whited out in the background. The sun is out today. It's a clear blue sky. And I actually prefer it a little overcast because the sun really obscures some of the scenery in the video. But today we're in Numbers chapter 32. And we're moving along, we're getting towards the end of the book. This book only has 36 chapters. Now, in this chapter, uh, a strange situation comes up. We know that the children of Israel have been anticipating going into the Promised Land and what the Lord had promised to give them there. Well, then a situation comes up where some of the children of Israel aren't so sure they want to go in. Or it seems that they trust their own decisions and judgments more than they trust God. That's what it seems like to me. So let's get right into it here. Numbers chapter 32, verse 1. Now the children of Reuben... And the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. Now, they camped on the same side of the tabernacle. They were both on the southern side of the tabernacle. The tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and the tribe of Simeon is down there too on the southern side. But Simeon is not mentioned here. The children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that behold, the place was a place for cattle. They had a lot of cattle. Now the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead that it's talking about here is on the east side of the Jordan. They hadn't gone into the promised land yet. Okay? So they liked this land here, which was the Moabite area. All right? And the Moabites had been greatly subdued. When they came into that land, they defeated the king of Sihon and his people. They were Moabites there. And King Og and the people that he had. Now, Og was a giant. But these people were no longer there. So the land was mostly unpopulated. And I take it that it was... A flat land, relatively flat there, because it was a good place for the cattle. Now notice that it says in that first verse there, when they saw, that's a key part of this chapter, when they saw, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad saw the land there, and they liked it for their cattle and everything. Now they knew that God had something promised for them in the promised land, and it would certainly be something great, but they like this land here. When we go on, we see that. Verse 2, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, Adaroth and Dibon and Jazer and Nimrah and Heshbon and Eliala and Shebam, and Nebo, and Beon. These are all locations in that land there. I don't know if they're maybe cities or villages, settlements, but there's names for different parts of the land there. They go on, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel. Like I mentioned here, they defeated king, the king of Sihon and King Og. Even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle. And thy servants have cattle. 
Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, now they're talking to Moses here, they're asking him, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession and bring us not over Jordan. Okay? So, they were giving priority here to what they saw over what God may have intended for them in the promised land. And they didn't really know what that was going to be, for sure. They were told it was a land flowing with milk and honey, and the spies brought back some reports of it, and they knew that they were going in there. So it's not that they didn't have faith, but what they saw was provable. They could see it with their own eyes, and they were wanting this above whatever the Lord might give them. All right? Now, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, the Apostle John says there, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Yeah. As Christians, we can relate this to our walk through the world. We should long to enter into our promised land. You know? We should be looking forward to what God has for us when we're done with this life. It's much better than anything that we'll have here. So, to compare this and to be like for us, really hanging on to what we have here and wishing that we could live forever, wishing we could stay here instead of entering into the glorious things that he's promised us. That's what was going on here. But it was all in the natural, you know. Although, even back then, God's promises involved very much of the spiritual also. Verse 6. And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, this is his answer to them, Shall your brethren go to war? And shall ye sit here? Because they were getting ready to go in and conquer the land. And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? Now we have to remember what happened. What happened 40 years before when the spies went into the land and they brought back a bad report and it discouraged the whole nation from going in. They said, oh, we can't defeat it. There's giants there. They were basically saying the Lord is not able. So Moses is comparing it with that here. Verse 8, thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. For when they went up unto the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the children of Israel that they should not go into the land which the Lord had given them. And the Lord's anger was kindled the same time. And he swear, saying, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from twenty years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob." Because they have not wholly followed me, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. Okay, remember? There were 12 spies sent out. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, brought back a good report, and they said, yeah, there's giants there and all that, but we are well able to defeat them. The other ten said, no, there's no way we can defeat this. There's no way that we can defeat these people. You know, <laughs> they didn't believe the Lord was able. So that was their sin. And that's why they didn't enter in. And they had the punishment of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, this is a famous verse. The Apostle Paul tells us there, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, 
or temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Right. We know that God has wonderful things planned for us, whether we can see them or not. So it would be foolish for us to want to hang on to what we have here just because we can see it with these physical eyes, you know. He has so much better in store for his children. Moses goes on here. He's rebuking them for wanting to settle there on the east side of the Jordan. That wasn't really part of the promised land. So they're they're asking for for their gift to be that land. All right? It wasn't that they had no faith to defeat the people in the promised land and to go in and take the land. They didn't doubt that. They knew they'd be able to take the land. What it was that they doubted was their parcel of land that the Lord was going to give them because the land that they were seeing here was perfect for what they wanted. So because of their eyes, because of what they saw, and that it was right there and it was accessible, they wanted that instead of having faith in what God had in store for them. But Moses goes on and says, And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel. He's still speaking about what happened back at Kadesh Barnea 40 years earlier. The Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. And behold, ye are risen up in your father's stead an increase of sinful men to augment yet the fierce anger of the Lord toward Israel. Okay, so he was accusing them of doing the same thing. For if ye turn away from after him, he will yet again leave them in the wilderness, and ye shall destroy all this people. Okay? So he was afraid that something similar would happen. Here they are getting ready to enter, and and they're wanting to stay there. Now, like I said, in their defense, they weren't unbelieving that the Lord would bring them into the promised land. It wasn't that. And give them land as an inheritance. They knew that he was going to do that. They just wanted this particular land to be that inheritance. They wanted to say, whatever whatever you had planned for us, Lord, whatever land you were going to give us, keep that and let us have this instead. Okay? The Lord doesn't violate somebody's will. We've been talking about that, too. The problem here is, even though I could say that in their defense, the big problem here was that they thought their choice was more sure than trusting Yehovah, the Lord God, who brought them through so much and had blessed them in so many ways. They were trusting what they saw, their choice, more than what the Lord would choose for them. His unseen gift because they couldn't see it. So in their minds, it was like, how can we be assured that it will be as good as what we're seeing here? Now, one story that this really reminds me of here, reminds me of several different things, but Esau, despising his birthright, uh, he was the firstborn of Isaac. And the story there in Genesis chapter 25, verses 29 through 34, tells us what he did there. It says, and Jacob sod pottage. That means he made some type of a stew or soup or something like that, okay? Jacob sod pottage. And Esau came from the field and he was faint. Remember, Esau was a hunter. He was kind of a, a rough hunter type of guy, you know, an outdoorsman. Jacob was more meek, more of a person that would dwell in tents, you know. He was making soup or stew here, so maybe he was a cook. Maybe he was good at that. And Esau said to Jacob, he came in, he was tired from hunting or whatever he was doing. 
Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Edom meant red. Okay? And I guess this pottage, or stew, or whatever it was that Jacob was making, was red. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Because he had the birthright of being the firstborn. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? He was just hungry. He just wanted to feed his belly. He didn't care about some supposed birthright that was in his future that he couldn't see or touch or anything. See? He put the physical, his physical circumstances and the way he felt at that time ahead of the blessings that would be in store for him, maybe. And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright, or he didn't, didn't care about it at the time. He wasn't looking forward. He was a man of, of the here and now, of the present. He didn't care about what was promised him in the future. He didn't, he didn't put any faith in that. Okay? Now, they're kind of doing the same thing here, aren't they? They're putting their trust in what they can see. We see this land and it's perfect for us to just stay here. Regardless of what God may have promised us, and what he's going to bless us with in the promised land, we can see this. And so we hold this in higher esteem than the promise of God. This was their will to do this. God won't violate the will. Verse 16, And they came near unto him and said, We will build sheepfolds here for our cattle. This is the children of Reuben and Gad. Answering Moses back as a rebuttal. We will build sheepfolds here for our cattle and cities for our little ones. But we ourselves will go ready armed before the children of Israel. They weren't going to abandon them completely. So they're saying here, no, we're going to go in there and, and help you conquer the land. They were just saying that they wanted this land when it was all over. We ourselves will go ready armed before the children of Israel until we have brought them unto their place. And our little ones shall dwell in the fenced cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return unto our houses until the children of Israel have inherited every man his inheritance. He's saying if they're allowed to stay in this land here. For we will not inherit with them on yonder side of Jordan or forward because our inheritance has fallen to us on this side of Jordan, eastward. All right? So they're asking, they're asking Moses for the Lord's blessing that whatever land that he was going to give them, they were forfeiting that. They were going to give that up. Okay? Just like Esau gave up his birthright. They were going to give this up so that they could have this land right here that they can see because it's good. It's what they want. <laughs> see, the lust of the eyes, unwilling to wait and see what the Lord may have in store. Yeah. <laughs> Another passage that this reminds me of is Philippians 2, 21, where the Apostle Paul said, For all seek their own not the things which are Jesus Christ. Yeah. People want their own thing. People want their own way. You know, rather than give up their will, give up what they would rather have for the will of the Lord and follow him. Yeah. Now there's another instance where we see this in Scripture. In Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 through 13, when Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees with all his, his family and his flocks and his, uh, his nephew Lot came with him and they 
were a large multitude of people and their servants were arguing with each other and they decided that maybe they should split up you know lot take his people with him and abram take his people with him he wasn't abraham yet he was still abram and the narrative says there that that abram gave lot a choice of the land he said okay you pick what you want and i'll go the other way i'll take the other part of the land that you don't want he gave lot first choice verse 10 it says and lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of jordan with his eyes that it was well watered everywhere before the lord destroyed sodom and gomorrah yeah this is before that happened even as the garden of the lord it was a real lush beautiful well watered land like the land of egypt as thou comest unto zoar then lot chose him all the plain of jordan and lot journeyed east and they separated themselves the one from the other okay so lot took the best piece of land what looked so good to his eyes abram dwelled in the land of canaan and lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards sodom but the men of sodom were wicked and sinners before the lord exceedingly and we know how that story came out that was the area that lot picked he chose that it was lush and well watered and just beautiful but the land was full of sin full of corruption but that's what he chose and we know that didn't turn out too well for him you know this is similar they're wanting this instead of relying on the promise of god verse 20 now moses replies back to him and moses said unto them if ye will do this thing if ye will go armed before the lord to war and will go all of you armed over jordan before the war until he hath driven out his enemies from before him and the land be subdued before the lord then afterward ye shall return and be guiltless before the lord and before israel and this land shall be your possession before the lord so he's allowing it as long as they do what they said as long as they go in and help them conquer the whole land and everything then they can go back and they can take that that land there verse 23 but if ye will not do so behold ye have sinned against the lord and be sure your sin will find you out <laughs> that's an often quoted verse right and that is true in any aspect of our lives be sure your sin will find you out you know even if it's something you've hidden it'll come out eventually but this is where that phrase came from is right here he's warning them that they better stick to what they promised to do build your cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep and do that which hath proceeded out of your mouth all right so moses is done speaking there and the children of gad and the children of reuben spake unto moses saying thy servants will do as my lord commandeth our little ones our wives our flocks and all our cattle shall be there in the cities of gilead but thy servants will pass over every man armed for war before the lord to battle as my lord saith okay so this was an oath they're making an oath here to do what they said okay so concerning them moses commanded eleazar the priest and joshua the son of nun and the chief fathers of the tribes of the children of israel now we hear what moses commands them because remember moses is getting ready to die he's getting ready to die here so he's making these decisions before the lord takes him home so he's telling the chief men of israel joshua says the son of nun and the chief fathers of the tribes 
He's relaying to them what was promised by the tribes of Reuben and Gad. And Moses said unto them, If the children of Gad and the children of Reuben will pass with you over Jordan, every man armed to battle before the Lord, and the land shall be subdued before you, then ye shall give them the land of Gilead for a possession. So it's being granted. The land that they willed to have is being given to them in place of whatever the Lord may have planned for them. But if they will not pass over with you armed, they shall have possessions among you in the land of Canaan. Okay? So they don't forfeit. If they, if they don't do as they said, they aren't going to forfeit having any land at all, but they aren't going to get that that they wanted. They aren't going to get the land of Gilead. They're going to get probably the bottom of the barrel. It probably wouldn't even be what the Lord would have originally gave them. We don't know what it is that the Lord would have originally gave them. It doesn't say. So if they don't follow through, they won't get that land. They'll just have to accept whatever it is that they're given. If they don't stick to their oath. Verse 31. And the children of Gad and the children of Reuben answered, saying, As the Lord hath said unto thy servants, so will we do. We will pass over, armed before the Lord, into the land of Canaan, that the possession of our inheritance on this side of Jordan may be ours. Okay? They, they're they saying that that's what they're doing. They're doing it so that they'll get that possession. And Moses gave unto them, even to the children of Gad, and to the children of Reuben, and unto half the tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. It's the first time that's been mentioned. So the tribe of Manasseh was split up here when they eventually settled in the land. The tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh joined with them, and they stayed there in Gilead after the land was conquered. And here it names what it was. The kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, the land with the cities thereof in the coasts, even the cities of the country round about. Now here, from verse 34 to the end of the chapter, is kind of a list of what lands they settled in there. Okay, And the children of Gad built Dibon, and Ataroth, and Eroer, and Atroth, Shofan, and Jezer, and Jogbeha, and Beth Nimrah, and Beth Haran, fenced cities and folds for sheep. And the children of Reuben built Heshbon, and Eliala, and Kerjathaim, and Nebo, and Baalmion. Their names being changed, it says here. So their names were changed to something else. And Shibma, and gave other names unto the cities which they builded. And the children of Maker, the son of Manasseh, went to Gilead and took it, and dispossessed the Amorite which was in it. And Moses gave Gilead unto Maker, the son of Manasseh, and he dwelt therein, and Jair, the son of Manasseh, went and took the small towns thereof and called them Havoth-Jair. And Noba went and took Kenath and the villages thereof and called it Noba, after his own name. And they did that a lot. They named the cities after themselves many times. Now that's the end of the chapter there. Okay, so God very rarely will violate our free will. I can't say that never he wouldn't. I guess there'd be some cases where he might, <laughs> if he's not going to allow us to do something, you know. But generally, he's not going to violate our free will. If we decide to do something, and that's what we would rather do, then our free will stands most of the time. And that's what happened here. 
That is what they wanted. That's the inheritance that they wanted. They were exchanging whatever the Lord had in store for them for what they saw with their eyes. Later on, there was trouble there. You know, and it might not have been the same way, maybe, if they had continued and gone on into the promised land. Who knows? And the big thing that I take away from this is what blessings have we missed out on at different times in our lives? Because we were unwilling to wait on what the Lord wanted for us. I can think of several different things in my own life. When I was impatient and I rushed ahead, you know, especially, you know, when I was living in the world, before I was truly born again, I made some really, really foolish, rash decisions. And a lot of those things I look back on in a way in regret, although what has happened has has worked out and the Lord has me doing what he wants me to do right now. But I just wonder often, I think, you know, if I would have trusted in the Lord then and would have held off and not jumped ahead with my own will and messed my life all up, what might have happened? You know, of course, my whole life course would have changed completely. Uh, the children that I have, <laughs> the grandchildren that I have, the great-grandchildren that I have, all these things would have changed. You know, so I don't really, now, at this point, I don't really regret, but I often wonder, what might the Lord have had in store for me? <laughs> what great blessings would have been there? Those were sandhill cranes that you were here and there. <laughs> Those of you that watch me normally know there's a lot of them up here. Now, I didn't see any. I brought my zoom camera with me because I wanted to film them if, if they were anywhere close by. And I think either they were just flying by or maybe they're down here in the reeds where I can't see them. That's a possibility. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time together with my friends. Lord, I ask that you would give us patience and give us wisdom to trust you, to trust what you have in store for us and not putting all of our trust in our own physical senses here in, in just what we can see and what may be easy for us to obtain at a certain point if we know that you want us to hold off, that you have something better for us, Lord, give us the patience and give us, give us the wisdom to do that and to wait on you. And Lord, we look so forward to all that you have in store for us in the future. <laughs> we just give you all the glory in all these things. Lord, I ask that everyone listening will be touched in a special way and that this will really speak to their hearts. And I give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Well, by next week, hopefully I won't have to bundle up like this. This is really cold out today. I walked a long way out here. I'm about a mile from my car, and I do have gloves to wear back on my walk back. <laughs> I bundled up quite a bit. But I love you all, and I'll see you the next time around. Bye-bye. Praising my soul, praising my soul.